Uh, thank you very kind. Yep. I got it. Uh, thank you, Abhishek. Thank you very kindly. And to everyone here, I appreciate the opportunity to present. Um, let me go ahead and cut over into uh, uh, share screen. I've got some slides. There's way too many slides to go through, but some of these will be good background. Hopefully it'll help provide some links to primary sources and other kinds of resources if, if there might be particular items you're interested in. Uh, and these are all online. Also, I really, I really do prefer to uh, talk about questions, discuss things um, in the midst. So I'll be watching chat, or at least I'll, I'll try to watch chat, uh, but please feel free to interrupt uh, just to get my attention uh, if there's any questions that come up in the midst. And, oh, there we go, okay, great. Alrighty, um, did, does this come through okay? Yep. Good. Yep. Okay, great, thanks. Alrighty, um, so, like I say, this is online, so there there is a version of the slides uh, that are available, and they have a lot of links out there, if, if that might be useful for you. We'll paste this URL later on and send it around. Uh, the, the topic here is about graph-based data science. It's something that's emerging in the field for uh, data science in general, and, and what we're seeing as complementary approaches to, you know, more typical supervised machine learning. Uh, I've been exploring this area for a while, and it's interesting because just last week, Gartner turned around and started recommending this. Um, if you're familiar with Gartner Research, they came out last July and said, oh, we don't really know about knowledge graphs, you know, not, not really sure about where this is going. And February 16th, they had a report that said, uh, well, we'll cover it in a little bit, but they, they did a complete about face. So uh, there've been a number of conferences recently where this has been a topic and uh, definitely seeing it emerging in different areas. Um, as far as who I am, just brief background, I, I made the very big mistake of uh, not following advice and studying something uh, in grad school. Uh, everybody said it was a big mistake. AI, you know, wasn't gonna go anywhere. Um, so I was at Stanford in the early to mid eighties and then I made an even bigger mistake. Everybody warned me away. I spent about seven years doing research and development in neural networks, um, including some hardware accelerator work uh, out in the field. I, I wrote uh, neural network software in microcode for uh, Motorola when they first did their uh, uh, accelerator project back in 1989. Um, and then during the AI winter, I went out and did a lot of network engineering, some cross compiler work for embedded systems, uh, a lot of network security. Um, I ended up having a very strange phone call from Seattle and some friends were working on a new project and wanted to bounce ideas off me. Um, so I ended up being kind of a guinea pig for AWS. Uh, and then later on, I led the first large um, Hadoop instance on EC2, uh, where we literally had to go in and fix a JIRA ticket on Hadoop to make it run efficiently on, on AWS. Uh, and we became a case study for Elastic MapReduce, and I, I worked closely with Amazon on that and some of the other services too, like Cluster Compute. Um, and anyway, long story short, I was on their customer advisory board for a while. Uh, and part of that led to an invitation to uh, Berkeley uh, to give a guest lecture. Uh, David Patterson was writing a paper, so I'd commented on it. And uh, it was very interesting because at that guest lecture, the audience included some first year PhD students who would later become rather well known, um, Matej Zaharia being one of them. Uh, so I, I got involved with uh, Apache Mesos and then later Apache Spark um, and used to be on exec staff at Databricks. Um, here's a few things just kind of in my general sphere of interest. Uh, I was effectively co-chair for AutoML Summit last year. There's a lot of great material there. So we, we were able to pull together a lot of people working in open source on AutoML. Um, so I, I definitely recommend that. That was actually kind of surprising how much we could pack into one day. Um, I've been doing a lot of work with uh, the Ray Project out of Berkeley and uh, leading some tutorials on both on reinforcement learning as well as on just the, the core features for distributed systems. There's sort of a pattern language in Ray for uh, building up your own different distributed patterns in Python or Java, um, whether you wanna work with actors or uh, you know, parallel iterators or, or however. Um, 
I've also been very much involved with uh, surveys. My colleague, Ben Lorca, he and I have uh, done a lot of work over the years. Ben led Strata Data Conference and then the AI Conference at O'Reilly. He's now at his own company called Gradient Flow. And uh, we do a lot of industry surveys and then reports about what trends are happening in the industry. Uh, most recently, we've published the, uh, the NLP survey, um, which actually has some bearing on Knowledge Graph. And now we're working on the AI healthcare survey, which will come up at the, uh, uh, there's a, a conference about that coming up next month. Um, I've also been very much involved in a series, uh, my colleague uh, uh, Shoshanka Das, who was at LinkedIn leading their GDPR effort. And now he's at another company. I'm not sure if I'm even allowed to say what it is, but uh, uh, there's been, a, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but there's been a collection of um, different firms that are involved in graph-based approaches as um, primarily as a response for compliance requirements, but uh, then getting into this area of what Joe Hellerstein at Berkeley calls uh, data context and the idea of having coherence across a lot of data silos and what can we do with metadata, uh, data set usage, but also people data within an organization. So this is something that's become a hot topic for LinkedIn, Lyft, Netflix, Uber, Airbnb, PayPal. And we, we basically got a lot of the project leads together to find common ground and articulate about best practices. We'll be doing that as an ongoing series. Um, Okay, I'm gonna scoot through this section real quick. It's probably not really our topic, but it might have some interesting points. You know, uh, building a, a Python open source project, there's some really great tools for that on GitHub. It's a great skill to have. Uh, publishing an, a Python open source package with all the things that you really need to support, that's a little bit more work, but that's a, that's a really wonderful, valuable skill to have. Uh, doing an open source package in Python that integrates dozens of other libraries and provides features for integrating different types of, of AI work. Uh, well, that, that's a lot to do. And, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely been fun. Um, and, and the question is why? Um, you know, one thing that I found over the years is that uh, well, actually, I think I've even got a link here to it, yes. So one of the small books that I wrote recently was called 50 Years of Data Management and Beyond. And we, we examined that. Uh, there's, a, there's a similar kind of publication. If you read uh, Communications to the ACM this month, uh, Juan Cicada is co-author on uh, a, a similar kind of article, uh, looking over the years at data management and how has notions of, of graph-based work evolved. Um, one of the things that I find is that there's this kind of tension in the industry between vendors who want to go out and say, we are the global leader in XYZ and just use our product, it'll solve everything. There's this tension between that philosophy and the idea of integration work and open source. Um, and so I really like the latter. I, I, I tend to be rather vendor agnostic and uh, I really like doing integration work in open source. Um, so having said that, there's a project called KG Lab, and we're not really doing a whole lot of new work there. Um, it's more a matter of a lot of integration and making sure that we have good unit testing in place and a lot of use cases highlighted. Uh, a lot of really good tutorials and all too. But it's called KG Lab, and it pulls together a lot of different graph libraries. And that's part of what I'll talk about here today. Um, and the reason for this is that if you look at what's being required these days. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of complex graphs under the hood. Um, and, and certainly there's also this need to be able to combine, uh, you know, ever increasing uh, size of, of machine learning models, really large machine learning models, but also increase in, in incorporate with them domain knowledge, uh, which gets into more probabilistic rule systems and graph algorithms and other kinds of approaches. Um, and so I, you know, I'm really interested in the, the graph types of approaches because they've been around for decades. They're inherent within virtually any SQL engine, uh, within any spreadsheet, um, but they're typically not exposed, or at least they hadn't been. And now we're getting to a point where we, we really have the compute power to do a lot of interesting things with graphs. Um, and I would like to see ways of getting the different communities to talk with each other. <clears throat> 
Um, so that's what we're doing with KG Lab is looking at where we can, on the one hand, pull in a lot of popular graph libraries and find ways to have you know, common formats or transforms in between them, um, but at the same time integrate toward popular data science approaches, uh, you know, make them speak fluently in terms of pandas and NumPy and scikit-learn. Um, but yet at the same time, also be mindful about uh, the distributed systems infrastructure and being performant, uh, being able to have good data engineering practices, uh, working with Parquet and, and Arrow and working with Rapids and, and others as well. Okay, um, real quick, uh, just some of the business case. This is probably for a different audience, but if it helps out, um, one thing that I like to, to bring out about graph work is that most of the time when you ask people to describe data, they'll probably start by describing a table. And most people, when they think of data, they think in terms of rows and columns, tabular representation, a matrix, a grid, a plot. Um, they think about spreadsheets, it's, it's ubiquitous. Uh, actually, a friend of mine does research on behalf of Microsoft, she's in the Netherlands, but uh, does research about spreadsheets uh, at a university. And, and it's, it's interesting that so many of the large companies across the world, their last mile of reporting is done in Excel. Um, when you think about like what they're filing to the SEC, um, so much of that computation is done in Excel. So spreadsheets are everywhere. Uh, also, you know, most people think about relational databases, even though realistically hierarchical databases are, are more popular in terms of usage, but they're just not very well known. Most people don't do programming on them. Um, so um, my point there is that, you know, this idea of tabular form for data is interesting and it's what most people reference, except that it's not really the case. When you dig into what is the what are the business rules, the business logic that's represented in a spreadsheet, and what is the process there? Um, when you start to dig into those nuances and try to understand what's going on in a spreadsheet, what's what's going on inside of a complex SQL query, um, you run headlong into graphs. And so, to be able to understand what's going on in the graphs, that becomes important because otherwise, you know, this information, this metadata, gets swept under the rug and it, over time becomes tech deck. Um, and, and this idea of forcing the shape of data into something that it's not, you know, the, these are the kind of things that, that cause problems in IT, service failures, project delays, they lead to compliance issues, security risks, et cetera. So um, this is where I'll mention, this is from last week, uh, or maybe a little bit more than last week now, um, but, uh, I found out about this just a, a couple of days ago, uh, but Gartner reversed their decision about the future of knowledge graphs. And you know they're saying that 80% of data analytics by 2025 will be based on graph approaches uh, up from 10% this year. And that it really facilitates much more pervasive and rapid decision-making in enterprise. Um, it's kind of a change of thinking, a, a graph mindset. And, uh, and currently Gartner is seeing 50% of the inquiries about AI are graph related. Um, and, and also what's really key, something that we heard about at Metadata Day is across the board, when you talk to IT out in practice uh, at large firms, they will say that they're using graph based approaches uh, because of their data infrastructure. And what was striking to me was, I mean, and this is, if you read the ground context paper by Joe Hellestein, and Sri Shankar Das and others, um, this is the point they made in 2017. But what was really striking to me when we led the metadata event was uh, Natasha Noy, uh, who's very famous. She wrote the Ontology 101 paper 20 years ago, and she's very famous around Google as one of their, their lead researchers and experts in graph. Um, Natasha made the point that even at Google, the, a lot of the rationale for having knowledge graph at Google was about the fact of having a lot of data silos and trying to have some sort of coherence layer over the top of their data silos. Because Google recognized they couldn't have one data framework for everything. And they had to allow for a lot of different teams to collaborate together in parallel without any sort of centralized bottleneck. And so a lot of the rhyme and reason, as Natasha Noy put it, was that their rationale for doing Knowledge Graph was very much informed about their IT problems and their tech debt problems. Um, and also you're seeing this throughout industry. Most of the firms I talk with, this is a consideration. 
sorry. Um, so I, I do a lot of work with Ben Lorca. We have a number of surveys. We have one <laughs> I'm editing right now. Ben finished his part, I have to finish mine, but there'll be one coming out about AI healthcare soon too. And in particular, our most recent one that we published was about NLP adoption in industry. And what was interesting was that the number four use case for NLP in industry now has to do with knowledge graph work. Um, that was a, a very interesting finding and it's definitely borne out in practice. Um, as far as some um, business use cases, you know, there are some well-known ones. I mentioned Google, obviously, but you know, there's some ones that are, they're having a lot of impact right now. Certainly AstraZeneca and Benevolent AI, both those firms have been doing graph-based work for a while. They have this expertise. Um, they have some joint venture uh, collaboration, uh, for instance, in accelerating drug discovery and trying to find opportunities for drugs that may have been overlooked because of high dimensional problems where you know, researchers just couldn't connect the dots in the research. Um, and so they, this is a very interesting area of AI applications of being able to find those links in the biochemistry uh, where it, it's really just too much of a high dimensional problem for humans to grapple with all of the data. Um, another one in a very different area, uh, another knowledge graph area that's emerging is, is what I was talking about from Metadata Day. Uh, there's a, a really great case study by Mark Grover talking about what they found at Lyft. Um, he was leading out their GDPR compliance and they started with a graph-based approach, bringing in data catalog, bringing in operational metrics, but then they started looking at the use, uses for data um, upstream and downstream from the data science team. And then they started bringing in the people data. And that's very important because at some point in that conversation in, a, in an industry setting, typically my boss's boss will go need to talk with your boss's boss and come to an agreement about, yes, we will support and fund collaborations across the organization. Um, and what Lyft found was number one, their data science team uh, was spending about 30% of its time just looking up metadata for data sets over and over again. And having led data sets in industry, I can verify, yes, this is what you do. And this is what you spend a lot of time on while you're cleaning up data over and over again. So Lyft was able to deploy some interesting uh, graph and also some interesting UX work to go along with it, but uh, definitely to accelerate that for their, their data science team. And for Lyft, you know, 250 data scientists at Lyft, that translates to about $65 million a year for overhead on salaries. And so 30% cost is 20 million a year. That's, that's, that's substantial. But then from there, they were also able to find new business opportunities because they could have better insights about how different data sets might in fact pair together. Um, and when you read through some of what Mark, I've known Mark for years and, and I'm super excited to see this. He's actually spun out into a new company called Stemma.ai. Um, but when you read Mark's case study here on Medium, um, you know some of the terms that come up are about coherence across the silos, across organizations and also about trust, about getting different parts of the organization to trust each other in the context of AI applications. Um, we do have an ongoing series called Metadata Day, and uh, I think I have another slide about that too. Oh yeah, this one right here. Um, so this is an, an emerging category. There are now three funded startups in Silicon Valley uh, going after this space. And, uh, and, odd, and I'm an advisor to one of them, but I know the other two. And pretty much all the principals know each other. Um, but there's a set of, uh, there's about a dozen different open source projects where tech firms were initially responding to GDPR and CCPA and other compliance. And they, they all went with graph-based approaches. They all went after initially data catalog, but then they realized it's also largely a people problem. So they needed metadata from across the organization. And, and then 12 different organizations, uh, actually uh, Eugene Yao had a really good article about this. Um, 12 different organizations like launched open source projects to show off what they were doing in response to GDPR and they had a lot of similarity. So we started an ongoing series to bring the project leads together and discuss common ground. And so it's very interesting uh, graph based approaches for that. Um, but the general category here is called data context. Um, and also just in terms of knowledge graph, uh, just looking across industry, you know, certainly all the tech giants when it comes to content discovery and recommender systems, uh, graph projects are front and center at, at LinkedIn, at Amazon, at eBay, Apple, et cetera. 
Uh, manufacturing, certainly when it comes to a lot of details there, especially supply chain issues, uh, more and more you're seeing that at companies like Siemens and Bosch, BASF, and I've, I've talked with teams there. Uh, also healthcare, we talked about AstraZeneca, but certainly Johnson & Johnson, Optum, and others, there's a lot of very significant, uh, substantial work in, in knowledge graph. And, uh, you know, really the financial data services led this, uh, Bloomberg and Refinitiv, which used to be part of uh, Thomson Reuters. And, um, and also you see sophisticated audit compliance practices at IBM, Accenture, Capgemini, um, leveraging these kinds of techniques. And, and I've been talking to a lot of those folks too. I, just in general, what's a knowledge graph? Uh, you know, if you think of relaxing some of the constraints that you would typically have when you're representing data in a relational database, and instead think about uh, the general case of having an entity that has an, a unique name, it has some attributes. Some of those attributes are links out to other entities. Some of the attributes are values. Um, we have controlled vocabularies that describe the metadata that's possible, like what are the relationships that define links between entities? What are the representations of values, like date formats? Um, controlled vocabularies put together become ontology, basically. And you can mix and match these or extend them based on the use case. And what's interesting also is there's a fairly close correspondence between a lot of the, a lot of the practices out of you know, years of object-oriented programming. Um, there's a lot of similarity in what's going on in terms of the mix and match of controlled vocabularies and how to extend them. Um, so if you're familiar with working with class hierarchies, this is really not anything all that different, except for the names. Uh, but there is more of an, of a, a matter of inference is actually much stronger here, of course. The other thing I'd like to point out is that like working with knowledge graphs, one thing that's really interesting is that the shapes of data, the shapes of the connections become very important. Um, and effectively that kind of like topology uh, audit, if you will, um, it's very similar to the notion of data objects in relational databases, very similar ideas there. Um, in terms of graphs, what we are talking about is shared definitions and the problem of not having shared definitions across an organization. And, you know, kind of pulling back in the 20th century, there was this response to very large scale in organizations by having silos and having top-down command control structures and sort of uh, philosophies coming out of World War II. And, you know, that was great at the time, but it's sort of this emphasis on centralization. It also led to a lot of the kind of vulnerabilities that we're seeing now in the 21st century. And so, uh, especially, you know, in the context of, of uh, you know, cyber attacks, um, a lot of these notions of, of silos has been a problem. It's certainly been a problem in data science. It's, it's a lot of what we try to get across, uh, try to bridge across when it comes to data strategy. And, um, and, and that's a lot of what's being confronted in terms of graph work. And, and also a lot of the, the overlap between say AI and security right now is the graph work. One thing I'm not talking about very specifically is graph databases. There's a lot of fantastic work in graph databases, but I tend to work at a layer above that. And most of this conversation is relatively agnostic. It will work with or without any particular graph data store. Um, and, I, and I just also, I'm also very leery about making technology selections before you talk about use cases or before you talk about process. Um, it sort of goes against the science. Um, in terms of graphs, you will probably hear a, a whole collection of different acronyms. Um, there's definitely the semantic technologies. You know, semantic web had its heyday sort of in the period of like 98 through about 2005, but it's continued on and, and there's really been some interesting work lately. Um, but there's th that whole collection of RDF graphs and OWL and SCAS and Sparkle and all. It, talking with the graph database vendors, generally speaking, they're much more interested in property graphs. Um, and, and there are some, some differences. I mean, trying to represent property graphs in RDF leads into reification and a lot of mess. Um, but there, there's definitely a convergence that seems indicated. Um, so if you haven't seen it, there's the RDF star work. Um, that got stalled a little bit, but it actually picked up uh, middle of last year. I, I know certainly in the Python uh, part of this, that's been picking up steam. So um, watch for RDF star because it kind of bridges between these two different ideas. Um, and in terms of getting started in graph work, 
Uh, again, this is probably more of the business case, but if you're involved in an organization that's trying to understand where to start, this may be helpful. Um, I'm going to cite uh, some resources from the Knowledge Graph Conference, uh, some of our discourse Q&A, but uh, Amit Wisner and Phil Taylor in particular um, have a really, discussion, really good discussion about where to get started. You know, a lot of organizations I see, they take a top-down approach and they want to define an enterprise knowledge graph first before anything else. Um, a lot of times these tend to be more generic and maybe not grounded in the actual data or relationships or business process. Um, so, you know, that, that's kind of a liability. Um, there's a lot of other work that's sort of bottom up and often that's called personal knowledge graph. A lot of great reasons for that. <clears throat> the idea that a personal knowledge graph may grow and be used by a team and then across different teams and eventually become something that's used throughout an organization, it, it does happen. Um, it may not have enough common abstractions and collaborations to really uh, follow through on that growth without a lot of significant change. Um, what's usually a much more effective data strategy is what's called a middle out approach, where you, know, you start with concepts that are in your domain, you generalize to link into the higher level concepts, uh, but then you also add more concrete parts of it that it fit the use cases and just iterate on there sort of linking above, but also representing below. And this is what I've done in my practice in different organizations, doing more of a middle out approach. Um, and I, I definitely recommend some resources. Um, Ashley Faith on YouTube, uh, she's at one of the vendors, uh, really brilliant uh, videos about getting started in Knowledge Graph, but also about data architecture and data strategy in general, some really great content. Um, another person I highly recommend is Dan McCrary. He's, uh, He's an executive at involved with, you know, representing to the, the exec staff about AI approaches um, at Optum Health. Um, and so they see very large enterprise use cases for Knowledge Graph. And he's been writing some fantastic articles on Medium. Dan is a really excellent storyteller. So he can take very complex engineering or scientific topics and, and bring them down into a very succinct story to illustrate um, the rationale and the rhyme and reason. Um, I'll also put in a plug, I'm very much involved in the Knowledge Graph Conference. Uh, this had started at uh, Columbia University, um, Francois Scharf and Thomas Dealey, and it's spun out of the university. Uh, they've got a team. I'm, I'm actually co-chair for workshops and tutorials this year, um, but I've also been helping co-edit -ed the uh, newsletter along with Ellie Young. And uh, we have a really active uh, community Slack with over 1,200 experts in Knowledge Graph and a lot of notable people from industry and from research who are involved there, um, several of whom are involved with like monthly office hours. I do that too. Uh, so if you are interested in this field and you want to network with people, that's a really great resource. It's open to the public. Um, and our next conference is coming up in early May. Um, also for primary sources, uh, I highly recommend a few of these here. Um, as I mentioned about um, Claudio Gutierrez and Juan Cicada, uh, really excellent article that just came out this month in communications of the ACM. Um, there's also the survey paper that's very famous from last year from um, Aiden Hogan and about 20 other authors, uh, but it's called Knowledge Graphs and it's very comprehensive. Um, certainly Natasha Noy and Deborah McGinnis. Natasha Noy is from Google, I mentioned. Natasha Noy is from um, RPI and, uh, you know, they wrote one of the foundational papers 20 years ago when they were researching at Stanford. Um, and if you roll the clock back into the 19th century, uh, Charles Sanders Peirce is one of my favorite scientists in U.S. history, also one of the most prolific scientists in U.S. history. He was founder of uh, USGS, uh, yeah, U.S. Geological Survey, um, really, really super interesting person. Um, he pioneered semiotics long before de Saussure, uh, really interesting work, but he, he gave a fairly good definition of semantic uh, graphs uh, back in 1882, if you read that monograph. Really interesting scientist. Um, a couple other things I'll point out. Uh, you know, one thing that I'm I'm tracking, definitely there's the work by Neil Thompson, I believe at MIT, and also uh, Michael Mahoney at Berkeley, um, pointing to some of the diminishing marginal returns that we're seeing uh, as we get to larger and larger and larger deep learning models where we have billions of parameters or now even 
trillions of parameters. Um, there's definitely some concerns. There's a, a one paper summary that Neil Thompson did on one of his recent papers about uh, just sort of the, the economics of custom hardware and uh, where he's seeing the trends on this. Um, deep learning is fantastic for some certain things, reinforcement learning as well, uh, very much involved in these, but there are some concerns about trying to fit the tool to the wrong purposes. Um, and certainly, you know, deep learning as function approximation, there's a lot of really great applications for that. Um, but I think uh, certainly in my field in natural language, there's, there's growing concern that it, some of the uh, embedded language models are probably going off on a tangent. They're too focused on the benchmarks, maybe not as focused on the use cases. Um, and that feeling is echoed by Uli Sattler at New Manchester. Um, we were in a track together at um, ISWC last year. Uh, she did this great lightning talk about the need for having much more hybrid approach between uh, what's going on in deep learning versus what's going on in more of the semantic technologies. Um, and, I, and I believe that. I really see this notion of hybrid approaches being a priority now. Um, I, I definitely would point out there's a great discussion. Uh, Mike Kedrawal is a professor in the Center for Knowledge Graph at USC. Uh, fantastic talks from Mike. And this is a, a really good uh, interview that he had with uh, my colleague, Ben Lorica. It's the idea of having knowledge graph as a kind of abstraction layer um, over and above a lot of other types of data sources. And it, and it gets back to a lot of the data context that, that Joe Hellerstein at Berkeley is talking about. So, you know, I mean, probably somewhere down the line, we could be looking at this notion of having lots of different data frameworks in an organization or a cross organization and having some sort of a semantic layer that makes coherence out of them. It's relatively lightweight, but it is based on knowledge graph. We're seeing this practice definitely at Google, but also at PayPal, Lyft, LinkedIn, Netflix, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then out into the corporates like at Bosch and BASF and Siemens and others. And so I, I do see this as a, as a way going forward in terms of data strategy, in terms of data engineering, of having much more graph-based approaches. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the next. This is a little bit more of like the math behind what we're doing with KG Lab. Um, but needless to say, you know, for a long time, we've been working with graphs as if they were matrices. So there is the, the uh, venerable area of algebraic graph theory. Very, very useful. We can take a graph and vectorize it. Uh, we can represent as different forms of matrices um, or in the general case, have graph relations represented by tensors. These are transforms that are, of course, very important in industry. And, you know, a lot of this goes back to some of the notions of that Tukey was, was describing back uh, with empirical data, analyt uh, data analysis back in the early 60s. Um, and certainly, if you go down this line, there's some very notable people. If you haven't seen it, uh, I will recommend uh, there's the uh, Sparse Matrix Museum that Tim Davis curates out of uh, Texas A&M. And uh, if you don't know who Tim Davis is, I will say that probably one of the best math lectures that I've ever uh, attended in my life, I, I caught Tim Davis lecturing at Stanford. It was the only time in my life I've ever seen standing room only for a math lecture. Um, so Tim Davis, if you don't know, if you, if you use, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, any kind of linear algebra libraries, whether they're talking about MATLAB or R, Python or CUDA or wherever, um, if you look in the details, you'll probably find that Tim Davis had a big hand in writing many, many, many of those. Um, so, you know, he's, he's one of the experts when it comes to factorization methods and, and how to use, you know, dense representation for GPUs and all this. Another person really good in this field is David Gleick, also formerly out of Stanford, but now at Purdue. Uh, really fantastic work on talking about graph algorithms and matrix factorization and a lot of related areas there. Um, however, a problem is that we're at this juncture now where we need not just the numeric representation, taking a graph and like shoving it into a matrix, but we also need the symbolic representation. There's reasons for both. And certainly the deep learning side of the world, you know, that's where we need to have a numeric representation. Um, and certainly a lot of graph algorithm libraries and all this too. But when it comes to human in the loop and natural language and response to regulatory compliance, uh, representing domain expertise and explainability, transparency, um, these require more the symbolic side. 
So there's a big need to have a blend and have transforms and inverse transforms between the sy symbolic and the numeric representations. So that's a lot of what we're doing with KG Lab. And realistically, this is much the same as you've seen with label encoding in scikit-learn or embedding in PyTorch, um, much the same idea. Um, and what this speaks to is the idea of dimensionality. Um, certainly when we're working in data science, a lot of what we do is managing dimensionality. So, you know, there's this general notion of going from unstructured data to having much more structured representation and leveraging the structure. Um, and dimensionality is an essential part of that. And it's, it's always a kind of trade-off between symbolic and numeric. Um, and, and I really see that as, as a point going forward, what Uli Sattler was saying effectively to deconstruct that uh, is more of what I'm representing on the left as opposed to what you're seeing on the right of just take all your data, dump it into one ginormous model and then hope that you never have a lawsuit or have regulators come ask you hard questions. Um, and what's on the right is kind of where the cloud vendors currently who you know, have first mover advantage, they have a lot of data sources, they have great AI teams, they own public clouds, they're publishing all these papers, but yet they seem fixated on what's on the right. I'm much more interested in what's on the left. And frankly, within industry, that's also very much priority. Um, so part of, that's part of the rhyme and reason what we're doing with KG Lab is integration with a lot of different areas. Frankly, a lot of areas that maybe didn't talk well with each other before. Um, and just to give you some idea, uh, oh, and, and I should be mindful about time, so I don't want to spend too much time. Um, Abhishek, what time are we going toward? Uh, we have a couple more minutes, so I think okay. we're good. Yeah. Great, thank you. I'll be quick. Um, I'll gloss over this, but within KG Lab, we're trying to make a lot of different types of graph approaches uh, fit into typical data science uh, workflows in Python. Um, and we've got some examples here. We've spent a lot of time on serialization because that's kind of the hard problem. Um, we've seen some fantastic work by using Parquet for graph serialization. Uh, we've spent a lot of time also just kind of regularizing the results of Sparkle queries, but more importantly, moving towards Shackle, um, what we can do with that, uh, we can talk more. And, uh, and importantly, also bridging the gap between what's going on in the semantic graphs versus what's going on in the graph algorithm side. Um, and this is particularly where you can take a lot of advantage of, of GPUs. One of my friends leads uh, the, the uh, CU graph part of this out of NVIDIA and we're working with him. Um, but there's also this trade-off in inference because there are many different types of inference that can be done with graphs. Um, and on the one hand, the semantic technologies are very focused on axiomatic approaches and leveraging closures, um, leveraging transitivity and associativity and all this. And it's great, great kind of inference. But you know, on the other hand, it doesn't work very well when you have a lot of uncertainty in your data. Um, so if you shift and pivot over to a different part of the quadrant here, deep learning, knowledge graph embedding, it's very capable of working with data that has a lot of uncertainty in it, um, although it's not particularly analytic. So, you know, what we see is that there's a lot of room for shifting back and forth and having complementary approaches, some that are axiomatic, some that are embedding deep learning, some that shift over into probabilistic graphs. And I, I believe this area here has a lot of promise because we get into, you know, Markov networks, we get into Bayesian networks, we get into causality and a lot of super interesting areas that I see a big need to have those complementing, uh, complementing the other graph techniques, particularly when you talk about human mill loop and, and talk about uh, data quality checks and validation explainability, et cetera. Um, so we have some examples of that in our tutorials. Um, I'm gonna, there's actually one that's based on a lot of recipes. So we kind of work through that. Um, and just two other things I'll put in a plug for. One is I have done a lot of work with natural language, uh, graph-based natural language, what's called text graphs. Um, and the, the papers there really come from Radha Mahasia, who's the lead AI professor at New Michigan now. Um, and also, you know, uh, some of her students, what they've been doing, we've implemented these algorithms, we fixed a bug in one of them. Um, but I, I've got a, a team on PyTextRank that uh, has been really active in this. Um, and that's, uh, it's a spacey pipeline component now. Uh, and this was a lot of the rhyme and reason of why we even started KG Lab was to be able to use knowledge graphs in a spacey pipeline. And the idea there is that 
uh, if you have a text, you know, if you parse out what the, the, um, the lemmas are, uh, what are the nouns and verbs and adjectives, get them into parts of speech, get them into their lemmatized form, um, and then draw links between them. Uh, what's interesting is you can run centrality on those graphs and pull out phrases with very high quality as far as phrase extraction. Um, but then if you can take a knowledge graph that has these concepts in them, um, then you can use that basically to import semantic relations into the graph that you build out of the text. And then when you run centrality on it, you get even better results. But a byproduct of that is you also get entity linking. Um, so what we're doing is something that leverages NER and noun chunking and other types of approaches that are in Spacey, but then has this other semantic layer to enrich that. And the byproduct of it is you get entity, entity linking. Um, so that's one area that's really interesting for grass right now. Another area is reinforcement learning. And I'm going to punch through uh, this just to say that, um, as I mentioned, in graphs, shapes equate to data objects. And when you can uh, use inference or machine learning or other methods to determine what shapes exist within a large graph, and for instance, if there's a kind of shape, does it, does it happen twice? Does it happen a thousand times? Does it happen a million times? Um, so one of the projects that we're working on is uh, essentially evolutionary software leveraging reinforcement learning. And the idea is to be able to understand topology that we can find, identify within parts of a graph, and then essentially use reinforcement learning to evolve uh, new complex shapes and test and find out if they're there, and then put them on a leaderboard. And so you, know, you end up with this like Pareto archive on a leaderboard of the complexity versus the statistical incidence of certain types of shapes that you find uh, inside of a graph. And this is really interesting because from there, you can go out and generate uh, sparkle queries or generate shackle rules for audits. Um, you can use this for link prediction. You can use this to um, generate OWL uh, relations for further inference. Uh, so this is a research project, um, but it's part of the rhyme and reason of KG Lab, and it has to do with leveraging Ray and Jim and others. So I think I'm up on time. Uh, if you want to uh, reach out to me afterwards, this is some of my contact info, and I will have I'll cut over to questions now, and we'll definitely have the links for all these slides later.